If it's your first time out of the vault and you go to Megaton like a good objective follower, Welcome to Megaton. you'll probably run into an eccentric inventor named Moira who asks you to help her research a book she's writing. There's an old super duper mart not far from here. I need to know if a place like that still has any food or medicine left in it. You decide, sure, going for a grocery run is a quick way to make some easy caps. So you head east to scout out the local Super Duper Mart. This is the place your innocent dies. Odds are this will be your first encounter with raiders and their unique choice of decor. <laughs> what kind of an idiot screws with a raider anyway? You may leave with a good stock of food and medicine, but you'll also lose a small but very precious piece of yourself. The part that believed that maybe this might be part of a plan of a higher power that has a purpose for the wretched wastes and its unfortunate inhabitants. Andale is a quaint little town filled with two happy, well-fed families, winner of the best neighborhood of the year, all in the middle of a nuclear wasteland, no less. Welcome to Andale, winner of the best town in the USA contest. You soon realize something's amiss when the cheery residents refuse to tell you why they've locked their sheds and basements joined with each other and hastily dodge the accusations of their crazy elderly Get resident. Get out while you can. Every time he does this, he scares our new friends off, and we love people. It's a shame when they slip out of our grubby little paws. <laughs> Only after picking the lock or stealing the keys to the basement or shed do you realize just how disturbed the inhabitants of Andale truly are. I couldn't help but notice that you're poking around in my basement. So be honest now, you wouldn't know anything about that, would you? And exactly what that strange meat that you'd pillaged and eaten from their fridges really was. Family first, and any man who says anything different is saying something wrong. And you should hit that man with a stick. The Deathclaw Sanctuary is no petting zoo, but rather a cave system filled with a dozen Deathclaws. Now, death claws are hard enough to combat in wide open spaces, so it's no stretch of the imagination to assume close quarter combat would quickly become your last actions as a living, breathing human being. Unfortunately, there is a bobblehead somewhere in the tunnels, so if you want to collect them all, you must venture deep into the lair of the death claws. Long winding tunnels filled with piles of bones and eviscerated corpses start to unsettle you and as your descent into the cave network progresses, every rattled bone or fallen piece of trash quickly becomes a silent death claw sneaking up behind you. The Arlington House sits neatly atop of a hill in Arlington Cemetery. An odd place for a home, sure, but nothing to lose sleep over in the post-apocalyptic wastelands. Perplexingly, if you venture into the basement of the Arlington House, you find two things, a workbench and a shrine to Abraham Lincoln himself, the 16th President of the United States of America. With offerings of wine and flowers placed in front of a lit altar, this shrine belongs to Jundas Plunkett, who sees Lincoln as some sort of deity. Inevitably, Jundas Plunkett will defend his makeshift altar of his god, with his life. The irony of this situation is that the Arlington House was originally owned by the famous Confederate General Robert E. Lee. The McAllen family townhouse, an unmarked location in downtown DC, the townhouse was previously home to the McAllen family made up of the parents, a baby, another child, a dog called Muffy, and of course, the family's Mr. Handy, which was the fashion at the time. Only the fates of the last three are known. The boy died in bed, the dog died in the backyard, and the robot lies dormant, but still fully functional at its station. If activated, Mr. Handy can be ordered to read a bedtime story to the child, in which case he floats into the bedroom and begins reciting, there will come soft rain to the child's skeleton. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. If told to walk the dog, Mr. Handy will promptly approach the corpse of Muffy and attempt to prop it up and walk the dog. The sight is sad 
and yet tremendously disturbing. The poem that Mr. Handy recites, There Will Come Soft Rains by Sarah Teasdale, is actually a post-apocalyptic poem from the 1920s, which also inspired Bradbury's story of the same name. In Bradbury's short story, the main computer of a robotic house reads the same poem, not knowing that the person who's supposed to be listening is long gone. Only one living thing makes an appearance in the Bradbury story, a wild dog, though it's a family dog in later versions, which has been slowly dying from radiation poisoning. It makes its way back to the house, only to die. Its corpse is swiftly removed by the house's automated cleaning robots. The dead body of the McKellen's dog, Muffy, can be found in the vicinity of the house's exterior, as well as the curiously placed radioactive drip in the kitchen. The Gold Ribbon Grocers While not exactly a textbook creepy location, it certainly is memorable and startling. The grocery is in fact a giant Rube Goldberg machine, and while standing on a pressure plate, it sets off a series of reactions that in the end reveals a corpse which slides down from a chute in the roof and has quite decent loot on it. It's baffling as to why this dangerous chain reaction was created and nigh impossible to decipher the reason behind a corpse wedged precariously a floor above. Now this place is worth a visit to be sure, but just make sure to pay attention to the screen when you do so. Radio towers are scattered across the capital wasteland. You can find several of these tall radio towers which can be activated via a switch at their base, revealing a radio signal. Typically, the signal is a Morse code frequency that leads to a cache of supplies. However, there are exceptions, like a distress message from a family hiding in a nearby drain pipe with a sick child. Please help if you can. I'm listening for your response. Answering the frantic pleas of what is presumably the child's father leads you down into a grated sewer tunnel. Upon arrival, however, you find that the skeletons of the family are huddled together, having all perished long before help could arrive. Another notable spine-chilling frequency only produces the sound of labored gurgling and wheezing. Vault 108 has been covered previously in our top 9 disturbing vaults in Fallout, yet we feel it deserves another mention. Most of the abandoned vaults in the capital wasteland are creepy, but this one takes the cake. You enter Vault 108, half expecting mildly eerie encounters, so when you hear a menacing voice beckon to you with, Gary, you shoot the guy and continue along your way, thinking not much of it, when you suddenly hear, ha ha, Gary. Again, you whip around only to find multiple enemies rushing straight at you, and strangely, they're exactly identical to each other. You then find that the entire vault is filled with cheerily psychotic clones who can only utter the word Gary with varying inflections. Gary! The DC Metro system is one of the most expansive areas in the game. The Metro tunnels are the primary way of getting in and around the DC ruins. What the hell are you doing in here? While broken up by rubble and debris, the DC Metro system is full of tunnels, wreck trains, and maintenance storerooms. A variety of enemies populate the Metro, such as super mutants, raiders, and of course, feral ghouls. Lots and lots of feral ghouls. One of the creepiest experiences in Fallout 3 is walking through the dusty tunnels and hearing the raspy cry of the desiccated husks, immediately followed by them sprinting at you, eyes ablaze with a ferocity and purpose that only a swift, hot lead lobotomy could possibly cure. At a glance, this seems like a benign building from the outset, nearly identical to many others in the wastes. This sense of security instantly evaporates and is replaced by a niggling sense of dread as you enter its unholy belly and it slowly reveals to you 
its insidious contents with undue glee. A small tendril of alarm hits the back of your mind the moment you enter the building. The door is facing north outside, but once the interior loads, you're already facing south. You then proceed to experience paranormal activity, such as violent hallucinations, doors opening and closing by themselves, and objects inexplicably being thrown to the floor. You also find the audio logs of a man named Jaime. Don't like the look of this place. Don't like the smell. It gives me the creeps. Don't want to risk a shot at the crows till I know what's in there. Sneaking in tonight. He has entered the building in search of his father. Hesitantly, as he proceeds into the bowels of the building, his tail marks his rapid descent into madness, as the building itself seems to claim his sanity and soul for its own wicked delights. Feast for the deep, Tabal. Born again. Here. al Hazared. Yes. Yes. You end up finding him in the basement, a shadow of his former self, a jabbering ghoul who's worshipping a mysterious obelisk. No doubt the source of the corruption that emanates menace and gives off unsettling whispers as you approach. The Krivbakni is a book which sits on the altar at the base of the obelisk, and it must be destroyed during a Point Lookout DLC quest. Ah! All of these being references to the HP Lovecraft Cthulhu Mythos. Cthulhu still lives too, I suppose, again in that chasm of stone which has shielded him since the sun was young. But his ministers on earth still bellow and prance and slay around idle capped monoliths in lonely places. Are there any Fallout 3 creepy locations we need to explore? Be sure to share them with us and your fellow Wastelanders in the comments below. And my name is Dash, so don't forget to look for me as I'll be answering your comments and questions. Thanks for watching, and as always, enjoy the game. Everybody loves somebody sometimes. Not me, baby.